Okay, guys, uh, I guess we'll get started. Um, kick it off. You're in the Building a Secure Multi-Tenant Cloud for SaaS Applications session. Uh, my name is Jennifer Lin, and uh, I'll be moderating uh, our panelists today. And I'm going to ask, uh, before we kick off, each of the folks to briefly introduce themselves. Um, so uh, actually, we'll, we'll go uh, slightly different order here. Edgar, why don't you start first? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. So my name is Edgar McGanna. I'm a Cloud Operations Architect for Wartikind. Um, been involved in the community since 2011, uh, still a core developer for Neutron. Lachlan Evenson, I'm a lead operations engineer with Lithium Technologies, uh, based out of San Francisco. Uh, been with Lithium about a year and a half, uh, OpenStack user and contributor for about the same amount of time. My turn. Steve Hallett with Symantec, uh, head up cloud engineering, and as of December last year, now part of uh, the OpenStack board. Okay, so thanks everyone for being here. Um, we, we wanted to focus this panel specifically on uh, delivering SaaS applications, and I think as we'll find through uh, through this session, uh, this this group of, of users has uh, very specific needs. The way we're going to run this is essentially uh, we've got some topics that are broken into four major areas, and we're going to use it really to guide the discussion more than anything. But I'm going to ask uh, each person to kind of give a little bit of background about their environment uh, and the use cases that they're driving with OpenStack. Uh, so I guess yeah, to start again. So next time is going to be stiff. Uh, so Wordy, Wordy is a SaaS company. Is um, so we produce uh, software as a service. Uh, so we have uh, human resources and finance uh, applications. We extend the applications to other barriers, and obviously um, we manage very critical information from our customers. And you can imagine uh, that security is our top priority. Uh, Lithium Technologies uh, is a social platform uh, where companies can engage with their consumers and users um, and form relationships in a, a hosted community. So about a year and a half ago, Symantec started down the path of building our own virtual private cloud on top of which we would be building next generation security and infra infrastructure management related applications. Uh, we went. Uh, into hardcore development mode about uh, a year ago right now and went into production last December. And in that respect, um, um, uh, we've, we've been able to abstract away some of the complexity of Neutron and just look at Neutron as an abstraction layer a a rather than a, its own you know, implementation. And it's really allowed us some flexibility as we have built and deployed our cloud in, in production capacity. Okay, so, um, you know, in terms of specific customer segments and, and target use cases, really just, uh, Steve, you started to kind of go through, um, you know, the fact that you're looking at VPC environments, but maybe you can expand a little bit on uh, the OpenStack use cases and some of the key, key criteria. Well, for us, it was critical to be able to marry OpenStack with bare metal um, at significant scale, running Hadoop, Storm, Kafka, stream processing, ingesting hundreds of terabytes. Um, an hour uh, and processing um, billions of, of uh, events a day. Uh, and so we needed to be able to not only scale the network, but to be able to scale OpenStack to support both a highly virtualized environment as well as bare metal in the same network. Um, and that's just a snapshot of what we're doing right now. Aki? So, yeah, similar story to Steve. Uh, so we have a bare metal environment, uh, an OpenStack environment, and we also, uh, prior to having OpenStack, we were out and running several workloads in AWS. So we were familiar with VPC, segregating networks, and we'd actually built a lot of our applications around the fact that um, d the data and the app were completely segregated at a network level. So what we wanted to provide in OpenStack was actually a, a consistent experience with that of a VPC, and do that same uh, experience on bare metal so that the experience at a networking layer across all those environments was consistent to the application developers. So in our case, we already have a, um, a high resolution. So we have um, applications running bare metal. So we have some solutions already in a, some kind of elastic cloud. You can imagine uh, just uh, when we're talking about human resources, finance, payroll, these kind of applications, they get some spikes and obviously running on the same um, 
fixed infrastructure will not scale up. So we already have a scan elastic solution that we want to make it more agile, more dynamic, even more faster. Uh, we want to be able to scale up. We want to be able to even provide better SLS for our customers. So um, OpenStack is providing us the best um, cloud management system. And obviously, we need to adapt it to our needs in terms of uh, uh, keeping the flexibility that we have right now, keeping the security levels that we have right now, and even increase it if it's possible, and also um, providing uh, even more agile technology for our customers. I think uh, this has to be among the m more demanding set of users, uh, given that these are internal application development teams that are really looking for a environment to really roll out their applications faster and faster. So I, I can imagine uh, it's not like you know some of the other segments that may be using OpenStack um, that are external audiences. You, this is uh, definitely a more demanding constituency. <laughs> And since, and since we're past proof of concept, right, our, our, our customer and our target, target audience is not the, the person or the team that's getting up to speed on OpenStack or that is looking to become a committer to OpenStack. Our customers are product developers who don't even want to know about OpenStack. They want it that stable, that scalable. So hiding that complexity from them is important so that we can actually, actually build and deliver revenue generating applications. Yeah, and I think that um, at least in the OpenStack community, there's been a lot of discussion about you know the development community versus the user operator community. In this case, you have highly uh, skilled developers as users who may yeah you know expand uh, expect a much higher level of uh, capability because they are development teams. <laughs> um, okay, so that was kind of a little bit of build up. We wanted to uh, in, in the next section, uh, just talk a little bit more about some of the unique requirements. Um, and since we're talking in all three cases about a SaaS environment with virtual private cloud expectations, maybe we can expand a little bit more on uh, issues like security and, and how you're measuring success in that environment uh, for, the, for the virtual private cloud. So yeah, maybe sure. I agree you can yeah, let me start. Uh, so our, our just case is uh, specific private cloud. Uh, we run everything on premises, obviously. Uh, we are a distributed system, of course. Um, we did, um, some of the requirements that we have, I already mentioned a little bit. So we have a very strong requirements in, the, in terms of security. And adding a layer of virtualization, we want to be sure that we keep covering those security requirements. We actually want to find any uh, possible gaps before even trying to uh, send these um, uh, open, op uh, open stack based uh, deployments to our internal dev environments. Um, there is another. There is another uh, very important use case, um, not just for our tenants, it's also for our internal teams. So we have a, bon uh, a bunch of application developers that are exploring new um, uh, enhancement to, to the current application, but also trying to create new applications to fulfill the requirements for our customers. And they need a very flexible, dynamic, scalable environment. So. OpenStack is giving us that that um, that management system. We are um, extending its capacity in terms to make it agnostic 100% to the developer. So they just have a set of APIs that actually not even the OpenStack APIs, APIs that they already already designed in their own uh, pipelines to actually convert it into a OpenStack pipeline, uh, APIs and end up having just a uh, environment up and ready um, and that can be disposable at any time. So dynamically creating these word logs, uh, removing them, and not having concerns about um, resources, because that is the whole idea behind it. Uh, so, so on our front, it was you know not only providing a consistent experience, but that also enabled us to have uh, the security guys sign off only once on a specific architecture at a network level. Um, so we didn't have to iterate back through uh, the whole certification process again internally. Um, so uh, segregating our traffic out into you know different different functions, functional units and entities and environments, basically down at the hypervisor level, we're splitting out VMs into different networks that at an IP overlay network are functionally different in different VRFs, um, and the, the traffic is is securely segregated. Um, automation, so. Uh, Providing VPC in OpenStack was crucial because our orchestration tool to actually deploy 
uh, our applications out to uh, given environments, I'd like to pool the resources. And VPC gave us a very clean way to, uh, you know, round up the resources in a way that was consumable to our orchestration tool, so that um, it wasn't horribly difficult uh, to uh, point it at OpenStack and have the orchestration tool understand it, given what we'd already done internally in MPLS and out in, in VPC and AWS. Steve? Uh, I'm wrestling how to answer this. Cause it, it, as most of us know, right, when you, when you start your implementation, you typically go down the path of, well, how do I stand this up private? Or you've got a partner that already has public space and, and you go down a path. We started, we started private uh, a year and a half ago and, and quickly, not just because we started discovering that the nature of our workloads and the location of the data that we needed to support meant that we no longer could think of just about private versus public and this notion of hybrid and everybody has a different definition of hybrid. But our customers and our, our customers who who were coming to us to learn, well, what what are you guys doing with OpenStack? Not to buy OpenStack because we don't sell OpenStack. What how, what are you doing? And we start talking to our, some of our biggest customers about what we're doing. They say, well, how can you support me? Because oh, by the way, Symantec or Veritas, guess what? We're moving hundreds of terabytes and petabytes to this cloud and that cloud and this cloud and that cloud. The hybrid cloud, I, I don't know what it means anymore. To, to us, it, it's, it's cloud. It's, it's not a location anymore. It truly is a capability. It's a mindset. It's a, it's a way of doing things. It's not a location. But then that means where's the edge? And where's the edge of the virtual private cloud? And how can we extend the edge so that we can consume resources? Because we have to, because our customers are saying, I'm running in a private cloud, I'm running on premise, I'm running in Amazon, I'm running in Rackspace, I'm running in Helion, I'm running in SoftLayer, I'm running in Rackspace simultaneously, in addition to my own private cloud. I haven't solved this. I am put, putting it. We're trying to figure out how do we do that, and and that's where you know we think that is where um, the thinking is moving uh, with, with the community here. Is what, where is the edge? Where is the edge? The edge has already moved. Where is the edge, and can, and can we get there in time to be able to support our customers? And uh, yeah, I think that you could say that. Uh, you know, at the application layer, part of the reason why, you know, there's so much excitement around containers is that notion of write once, run anywhere, or app portability. From a network perspective, and obviously that's our day job at uh, Contrail and Juniper, um, this sort of mediation layer between, uh, you know, the application and the, and the physical infrastructure is what we spend a lot of our time thinking about. Um, how do we essentially create federated domains that interconnect, whether it's public cloud or private cloud or someone's, you know, soft layer versus AWS versus Google Compute Engine. Um, you know, in the network, I think part of where uh, the network has been successful in federating heterogeneous domains is in recognizing that there is heterogeneity in those environments. And if you can solve the application portability problem and you can pull the compute and storage underneath, we can solve that network problem. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a journey and I think uh, some of the hard pieces are just being bubbled up. They're just now coming, right? So I mean, everybody heard some of the great stuff coming out with uh, you know Federated Keystone, right? I mean, let's look at what that, how does that perform in production now? Exactly. We're really excited about it. At least as, as OpenStack, right, so many of the people that have done sort of multi-region have done, let's say, one Keystone server and then multiple, you know, regions. But if we can federate that identity environment as well, it starts to get interesting. Not that it hasn't been done for other mobility technologies. Uh, you know, I think there's some lessons learned as that are coming into OpenStack in, in that environment as well, as well in terms of how do we do access control and enable mo mobility across federated domains without having, let's say, an identity server in every different site. Um, okay, so that, uh, any other comments about success metrics? I mean, how do you measure the success of, of uh, you know, these implementations, which obviously are ongoing, you constantly have to do upgrades. Um, the exit criteria for an OpenStack implementation, I think, is hard to, uh, uh, you know, to define. And very often, for instance, and as the vendor community, we're starting to see more uh, RFPs for uh, cloud implementations, but I think that exit criteria question is obviously very specific to your application environment and, and to the deployment that you're trying to do. How do you measure success? So in our case, we have two or three areas. Um, I will start with the, the one that's supposed to be the most um, simplest one, but it's actually very hard, which is to 
install it, right? So it was very funny, but there was a session earlier today about uh, how we felt with OpenStack because from the goal it was to supposed to be a simple to deploy it and actually we even create an ecosystem around the installations, support, maintenance, etc. because it's not easy. So uh, that was that was the very first. So we have a long list of requirements. Obviously, it has to be stable, has to be reliable, it has to be independent because we're not just creating one cloud. That's it. That's kind of like the difference between the private and the public, right? Uh, you have one public, you may create some federations, things like that. But in the private cloud, you create multiple private clouds, and so you just want it to be equal. You don't want your operations team or your infra team to just set out systems differently for every single cloud. You want it to be as homogeneous as possible. So we need to build a system that is repeatable, idempotent, etc. Um, that's kind of like the first the first metric. You need to be successful on doing that. So how you make how you measure that? Um, it's also based on the feedback from your infra team on your operation team, how happy they are, how frustrated they are. If they are not, you are doing a good job. If they are so frustrated because every time they are logging into the system or they are trying to find out what's going on, there's something wrong. Um, the second metric that we evaluate a lot is um, obviously the performance. Um, as you can imagine, when an application is running totally in bare metal and then you move into virtual machines before going to contain containers, uh, there is some performance degradation. Uh, it depends on the application, could be 10, could be 5, 20%. You don't want to increase the number. So another metric is just to keep your performance degradation as minimal as possible. And I'm mentioning this because you were talking about the networking layer, and the networking layer here is a key topic. If you start using open source technologies that actually increases the degradation of performance at the networking level, you will end up having a uh, a performance problem and also a scalability problem. So that is another key factor for us to actually decide whether we go to production or not. Yes, no compromises. Yeah. Lucky? Yeah, I, our requirements are very similar to Edgar's. Um, at the business level though, it is how quick can the developers iterate? So, you know, when we peel it all back and it comes down to the cloud ops, uh, team, you know, it's it's exactly the same. But what the business wants is, what are you providing? How stable is it? And how quickly can my developers iterate? So our key uh, success criteria is, is what we've done make iterations quicker. That's it. So app cycle time yep. and time to revenue for the actual business line that's supported by this cloud. Yes. Yep. Uh, I love it. Gr uh, great comments, uh, both uh, both of you. Uh, I c couldn't agree more. One other thing I think that helps us is the the notion of uh, with open source and a community. To what extent can my team actually commit back, contribute back? That that notion of of um, they have to be invested in the success of the technology. They have to be skilled enough, and that stickiness you create significant stickiness when now your team become part of the contribution cycle, the life cycle, right? And I think that's also an important success metric. So I, I, I want to make sure that the team is invested in the technologies that we're adopting and that they're doing the things necessary to become recognized by the community that have their blueprints, their designs, their code accepted. And I think that's just, yeah, part of the maturity of DevOps. I mean, uh, many of the folks that are trying to adopt um, OpenStack do not have this level of, of understanding and convergence yet of the development and operations team. And you're taking it one step further to say, you know, the actual success of uh, the technology that's underlying the app is owned by the app owners themselves. Uh, we'd love to see, uh, you know, more of that. I, I think there are definitely, um, you know, some segments that uh, have not yet converged in a, in a DevOps way and certainly not seeing sort of the success of the infrastructure being something that they help own. Uh, maybe, like you said, open source kind of drives that, that mentality. Well, it does, but if you're not shipping product every 12 to 18 months, like some of our business still is, right? Because we're, we're still in that shrink wrap business in some segments. If you're not shipping code every 12 to 18 months, but you're shipping code every two weeks, now you can have a different relationship yes. with your infrastructure. Exactly. Yeah, and so in terms of the cycle times, I mean, typically, yeah, what are the, how many releases, let's say, per month for the application environments that we're talking about in your, in your environments? Well, uh, in our case, it's very specific. We actually, we actually release every Friday. 
every week we have a, a future release and actually enhancement releases and uh, after a, a few iterations we have future release so it's very very dynamic uh, for us it really depends on the application we have uh, so our architecture so you know uh, everything is functionally broken down but uh, some of the larger apps, it's it's monthly, and we only have uh, all of our customers one release behind current. So, yeah, it's monthly cycle. Well, then this goes back into the ocean, right, of continuous delivery or deployment, and what's CI CD to you? Uh, we we ship um, continuous delivery every two weeks at the end of every sprint. If it's a critical patch, of course, then it's, it's much more frequent. But at the end of the day, we have to be able to deliver such that the product teams that are building and shipping product on top of our infrastructure can ship at their leisure. So we don't want to stand in the way of them shipping code, product, uh, and deploying that product in one region, two regions, and then globally. So it's very, very important that we've been able to prove and demonstrate the ability to upgrade our control plane with zero downtime upgrade our data plane with, I think it was 10 minute downtime the last time. That took a lot of time to figure out how to do that, to prove it, to be able to roll back, to prove it over and over and over again so that the team had the confidence to pull the trigger and show that we, we, we earned the trust to be able to do those rolling upgrades. Yeah, so for those that haven't seen it, Symantec has uh, shared quite a bit of information about how they've done the uh, upgrades thus far of various components within OpenStack. I think the first time you guys did that, uh, published was Havana to Icehouse, uh, and quite really nice work uh, from, from the team there. And then, you know, the, the work around CI, CD, and Edgar, I know you've been busy uh, this week yeah. sharing some of the best practices in terms of continuous integration and, and continuous delivery in your OpenStack environment. Yeah, absolutely. We, it's it's critical for us. I, I say before, right? The stability and the repeatability of the system. So we actually started from that, from having a very strong CI/CD system that it's uh, doable even in a laptop, right? And then we can move, migrate it to some virtual environments, and then we migrate it to bare metal. And you know, we are in the in the borderline to say like, do we really need to go to to bare metal? We ended up testing more in virtual environments that are actually bare metal. So what is the point to go into bare metal? So uh, we're still we're still in that lane. I, I got to tell you, Edgar demoed something really cool yesterday, and in a little we had a little private session, right? And and he demoed um, a developer experience, all laptop based. And there were a number of people that got up afterwards saying, "Hey, how can I get a hold of that?" So I mean, putting pressure on each of us, putting pressure on each other to share what we're learning. I mean, that's what the community is about, right? We're standing on each other's shoulders. We need to continue to give back what we've learned. And there's some pretty cool things going on. Yeah. No, thanks. That's, that's excellent. So uh, maybe some of the things that are a little t tougher. Can you talk a little bit about some of the specific challenges that you've seen and, um, you know, maybe some of the lessons learned and how you might mitigate some of these challenges moving forward just so we can share with, with others who may be earlier in the journey uh, to avoid some of those uh, pitfalls? Maybe Steve, I'll start on, on that side. <laughs> okay, so I won't mention V router. <laughs> uh, you know, we're growing, right? We have growing pains, and and uh, all of our partners are having growing pains in different different parts of products and product releases. Um, I think one of the things that we, we we bit off more than we could chew in terms of what was our what was our requirement uh, about a year ago. We wanted to do load balancing as a service, firewalls as a service, DNS as a service. We wanted to do everything at the same time and, and just you know, pick one, focus, deliver, execute. Um, I, I think that's something we learned um, and it humbled us, right? Uh, uh, making some mistakes, uh, losing a whole two week sprint and throwing it away. But it also taught our teams that it's okay. You, you can go down to a, a two week effort and you, you can throw that away without any impact to your credibility. Uh, but we, we, we have to recover from it quickly, quickly, quickly. And, and I think that's one of the things we, we still are struggling, and this is something that may be a different topic, I don't know, but we're still struggling with the notion of underlay versus overlay. Underlay, in my definition, is the, the network engineering team, the traditional network engineering team that we need and know and trust, and they're the folks that put their arms around racks of network gear and, and um, physical connectivity and, and circuits and the like, and the overlay which requires a different skill set 
And, and constantly having this conversation, well, just because the S in SDN is software doesn't mean necessarily that the IaaS team or the infrastructure as a service team it, it runs it. And, and we have this debate, right? What's, is it the S or is it the SD? Is it software defined? And then we have, a, we, ha, we, we have to recognize that our network engineering team is struggling. It's psychologically, it's traumatic for them right now because there are new skills that they need to be successful in this world. Can you code in Python? Or, as an example, uh, not that, that it's required, no. Do you want to? No. Well then, how are you gonna be successful with software-defined networking when you need to be able to get into code? We haven't solved that one either. And that's the people dynamic. We're still solving the people uh, part of it. And that's, I think that's gonna take another year or two to, to work its way out. We're trying to give our people incentives to learn the new skills, but it's hard. There's a lot of fear there, right? And I'm just putting it out there because it's, it is part of the journey. Yes. Makes for a good blog topic. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, no, often, often the challenges are not just technical, for sure. Go ahead, Lucky. Absolutely, I agree. I agree with everything you said. I mean, much of the same at Lithium. Um, you know, it's, it's been as much as a cultural battle as it is technical. Um, you know, the saying is internally, you know, how do, you, how do you eat an elephant? One piece at a time, you know, technically as engineers, we want to challenge ourselves, but we really had to peel it back and say, what services are we actually trying to deliver here? Um, and what does the business need? And coming out of uh, public clouds where they have, you know, very sticky features that some application developers have already gone and have at, uh, it's, it's hard to wind that back and say, you know, what do we actually need to deliver internally in our OpenStack offering? Do we need to match everything that the public uh, cloud provides? Or is it just a subset of that that actually matter to the business right now? So we try to, you know, boil it down to exactly what we would like to deliver and make sure that that is a stable, functional environment. Um, and then on the other hand, with, with the, uh, the culture, and, you know, one of our challenges is to be able to shrink wrap what we've delivered to the business and hand it to a wider audience of network engineers that have never touched an SDN. Mm -hmm. They're scared. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, and I don't blame them. You know, it's, it's perfectly natural. So we need to actually uh, go on that journey with them uh, where they haven't been involved in the past and actually say, you know, this is what we're doing. And, and it's our responsibility uh, to the company to hand it off as something that's actually supportable and maintainable going forward. Well, uh, so we are still in this journey, so we're still having those challenges and risks every day. Uh, I would say the most, the most critical for us was the, the, we created this amazing team of software engineers and for the first uh, couple of months or even a little bit long, uh, longer, they ended up being system engineers, right? Because they were trying to deploy the OpenStack, doing integration, testing stuff. So there was a point that when are we going to start really doing Python? And if you don't control that emotion because there's something inside of OpenStack that gets you addicted to trying to fix a patch or actually just in the testing, you start getting like, hmm, this function could be written differently. And that could be just like suspending. So actually, it was it's just it's, it's also amazing because we have one intern actually fixing a code in Keystone because well anyway, uh, it's it's providing the right direction. Um, is helping them to understand that it's just the beginning. Then will be all these beautiful contribution upstream. Uh, it's very important that OpenStack, I, I'm going to contradict myself. I said before that it was very complicated to, to deploy, it, but it's very easy to start playing with it. It's something that you can just get a dev stack in a virtual machine and you start playing, you start changing code, you can do a lot of things, right? But from that to production is like a whole C. So this group of amazing engineers, they need to understand that. And that was the biggest challenge that we are still facing every day. On the risk size, um, uh, there is a transformation between what your uh, operations team understands of how to operate a physical server, a switch, a router, versus a virtual machine, a container, 
a virtual device, a bridge, a tap interface, a bed device. Some of them, they are just totally new, all these concepts, right? So something that I like to play a little bit in the team is trying to move some of the inf networking guys to be as software engineers, as some of the software engineers to be system inf guys. And it's been very, very, very nice experience. Ended up that one of the network engineers started writing Python code to do API calls remotely, so simplifies his own job. So it's, it's, it's part of trying to let them know that it's kind of like part of the journey and it's going to, you know, bring some satisfaction at the end of the day. So in your environments, you actually, your core business is software. Some of what we've seen, let's say, in some of the large banks that are dipping a toe in the water in OpenStack, we, we, we saw a large bank who formed a tiger team of 17 people, and those 17 people jointly owned the success of the OpenStack environment. But those 17 people, I think two of them were network engineers, four of them were storage folks, three of them were sysadmins, and a couple of them were the application teams. And obviously a diverse skill set, but their bonus, their, you know, their MBO was tied to that joint uh, outcome. There was a lot of cross training in the in those six months, um, and that was sort of an interesting uh, way to do it. All right, so on to the next topic, and I think uh, Steve, you started to hit this a little bit, but can you comment a little bit on um, your your approach to open source, and um, you know how has that sort of helped or not addressed uh, some of the challenges that you've had? And then specifically, uh, not only the, the transparency and the agility benefits, but also uh, comment a little bit on you know things like OpenStack, which happen to be the largest open source project in the industry. Um, you know how that changes some of the thinking around interoperability and ecosystems and that kind of thing. Edgar. Yeah. So we're using a bunch of open source tools. Some of them are um, like. Started with OpenStack, obviously. We started also using uh, for our CD, CI, CD, uh, things like Jenkins, Docker containers, uh, backgrounds, uh, VirtualBox, etc. cetera. Uh, we also, in the network empire, uh, we are using open controls. And, um, and we're trying to understand first the technology, right? For much of the people in the team, they didn't even know what was OpenStack, uh, you know, a couple of uh, years ago. So. It's it's just trying to learn and trying to educate or on this open source technology, right? Um, we try to contribute upstream as much as possible. So we are uh, our configuration management is based on Chef. So uh, we are helping to the Chef community to grow. We um, so recently on this on this cycle, we're trying to formalize. Uh, Chef to be a, a, a one of the core projects for OpenStack. So one of our engineers become already a core member of that team, which is great. Um, and trying to contribute specifically in the networking part. We're trying to contribute also on the um, on the Glaze and, and Keystone part because they are very important for us. So we, we, we're very, very engaged with the community trying to increase it. Uh, for us, uh, I guess, uh, you know, as a user and a consumer of OpenStack, you know, and, and not only that, a contributor, uh, we're, we're kind of in the trenches day in, day out, and I think the value that we can add is, is in the stories and the lessons learnt, um, not only the, the pull requests. So actually saying, you know, this is how we're operating our stacks, and this is what we've learnt, and trying to feed that back to the community um, and help them not make the same mistakes potentially or learn together and I really feel like that is the power of of the open sources, the driving community behind it. Um, yeah. So I, w I think all of us here in the panel, right, we're wearing the user hat or the operator hat where it's it's not so much the the OpenStack developer hat. We depend upon the, the de development community for us to be able to build an infrastructure and operate it to support our, our customers. Uh, so as a user, I, I'm absolutely thrilled that uh, the the notion of DevCore has been accepted much more broadly and much more quickly than I was hoping. And we're, we're now transiting to this interoperability standard. And I think interoperability is important for those of us that use OpenStack because w we need to be able to know that those partners and vendors that we depend upon to deliver a whole solution 
are, are putting you know some skin in the game, right? And and so I think that's an important I think step in the maturity. But we also have to recognize that we have to be moving a little bit faster than just this every six month kind of mindset. And it's important for us as users of OpenStack to remind the rest of the community that um, we release a little bit faster than every six months, and therefore we 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 need the innovation spark to continue to burn very, very bright within this community. And, and it, we need to combine our voices as users just to, 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 to let everybody know how, that, that there is a strong user voice here. Yeah, I think it's, it's come to mean for many of the folks that are moving towards a more pervasive open source strategy, it's, it's really about agility, right? And uh, obviously the networking was one of the maybe last major components to actually move towards uh, open source en masse. Um, it, it also was surprising to see, you know, some of the carriers, for instance, uh, starting to make mandatory requirement open source technologies to make sure that they're pushing hard on innovation and recruiting the types of software development engineers that are pushing uh, faster and faster. All right, so I think we, uh, we probably hit lessons learned, and I wanted to make sure we leave a few minutes for, uh, for some questions unless uh, anyone has any things that, that weren't hit in terms of some of the specific lessons learned. Um, we can also save some of the, the look ahead for maybe the Q&A unless anyone wants to hit something very specific. I, I just want to say, yeah. yeah, very specific in lessons learned. So understand your use cases. Don't go wild and trying to build an open stack. Just understand your use case. I ended up talking to many other operators. They don't even understand their own use cases. And when they build their cloud, they ended up providing services that they are not useful for their use cases. It's just my advice. Uh, go deep, talking to the inf people, talk to the application developers, talk to the guys that cannot change the infrastructure. If you have some specific requirements, understand those requirements, put on paper, understand everything. Talk to other architects, talk to other companies. I, 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 as an operator, as Steve said, like, I would love to keep sharing all these best practices. I would love to see, like, we already w went through that pain. It's not needed for you to go through the pain. We can share as much as possible. So that's, that's kind of like my, my lesson learned. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, for us, it's, it's, it's very similar. Uh, you know, do your homework before you go into it and make sure you understand the, the scale you wish to operate it at because it's very difficult to go back after the fact and after you've made key decisions on projects you're investing in to go back and change that after the fact. Um, so yeah, that was w one, one of our challenges. Just get out there and talk to us. We're, we're happy to talk to you guys about what we've learnt and seen, uh, but really understanding each component, you know, boiling them down, compute, storage, network, how are you addressing each of those? How are they going to scale? What kind of redundancy? You know, do you need to do live migrations? All these kind of things. You know, because once you make those decisions, it's very hard to, to back them out at a later stage. Okay. All right. So uh, st st Steve will save his pearls of wisdom for the uh, for the Q and A. I'm already tapped out. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, we've got uh, three minutes, so let's open it up. And I think we've got a question. Yeah. Uh, great discussion. Thank you so much, panel members. Uh, Jennifer, phenomenal uh, moderation. Uh, I have a two-part question. The underwriters of the Contrail, uh, as a company, for example, uh, do you think uh, going forward your executive leadership will stay true to the agnostic uh, vision of uh, to the vision of being vendor agnostic uh, uh, in long run? And the second part of the question is going forward, uh, what could uh, basically, do you see would be a bigger challenge? Technical uh, challenges in interoperability, so that open control works with, say, a Cisco gear or a Juniper gear, XYZ gear, or will it be more political inertia? So, okay, um, thank you for the question. Uh, in terms of, you know, moving forward and, you know, do we think that the position of the executive leadership will change? Um, Contrail started up as, as a startup, um, not associated with a single vendor. Uh, when it was acquired by Juniper Networks, it was uh, you know, a, a decision explicitly to maintain the strategy of multi-vendor support for the underlay, driven essentially by the original IETF work that was done, which in ensured protocol level interoperability. And I, I hope to believe that a lot of the adoption that we've seen is because of that. So we talk from a control plane perspective, from a forwarding perspective, to the other network devices, just like they talked to 
for themselves, which doesn't say, I as a router, I'm only going to talk to you if you're a Juniper router, right? Um, and we test that <laughs> with them all the time, right? And so, and we've got uh, a few different data centers. If you walk in, you, you go into one data center, and there was a certain generation of folks that built it. You look at the tours, they're all Cisco. You go on the other one, the tours are all Arista. You go on the other one. So, I mean, all these different flavors, right? And interoperability has been demonstrated, and, and that's key to us. And I think, you know, the other thing, we, we've been, tried to been maniacally focused on listening to customers, um, and I think that is what the customers need because there's a lot of complexity, and now in opening up the network infrastructure to the application layer where the application teams want to be able to see latency between one container and another, the network guys traditionally had more information than, when, than was accessible, and now when you're exposing a lot of those analytics through REST APIs directly to your application teams or your cloud tenants, you, you can't discriminate whose implementation it is. So I think a lot of what's exciting from a software perspective in the networking industry is that some of these practices in software, good software development, are now coming back and, and you know, I, I guess exposing some of the challenges of proprietary operating systems for network gear that's very vendor specific. This is where if we create a mediation layer in terms of software defined networking or whatever you call it, it's really about enabling faster agility in the application layer. And that's why we we really enjoy the SaaS segment because I think that's where it's, you know, these folks need to roll out clouds very quickly and they don't, ha they don't have time to kind of, uh, you know, make sure that it's tested for one vendor and then rewrite it again for another vendor. Exactly. I just, I just want to say something about the first part of your question, which is great. I also have that question. And the way I answer myself and to the team is like, we need to own it. We need to own open, open control because it's open, it's open source, we, he, we see the code. We need to understand it, we need to get help whenever we need it, but if we own it and we distribute and we create a bigger community, well, we don't care what happened. And in full disclosure, in case I didn't do the justice of kind of uh, mentioning it before, you know, these three distinguished panelists are all part of the Open, open Contrail Advisory Board. Uh, they're all, you know, in production in their own environments with Open Contrail, and I, I think we've been doing a lot of listening and learning together, and, and I think part of what has been important in an early market is that you know, this notion, there will be issues along the way. I think how quickly can we kind of band together and move step forward? Change is hard, and there are going to be, you know, some, some bumps along the way. So we, we've definitely, I, I think, learned together. Thank you. Any other, oh, sure, go ahead. Yeah, just quickly, I mean, we, we had the same concerns going into it, and, and the fact that it was open was great, but was it really open, you know, and, and what did it look like? And, and yesterday we sat in a user group, and it was just amazing to see how many people had actually contributed usable uh, code to the community, to the, the project, right? So, you know, seeing each, each six months iterate, the room is more full and, you know, it, it is really coming to pass. So that gives us confidence and it is our dream as well, you know, as users, that we want to make sure that it remains open um, because that's part, most of the reason that we chose it. So it's, you know, it's up to, it's on us to keep it that way. And the commitment to deliver a single code base, which was delivered a year ago, and now we're living on a, a single code base, that was a huge uh, step in the right direction, right? And yeah. that was great for all of us. There's Absolutely. only one code base. Yes. So for, just to make it very clear, um, our master code repository on GitHub is the source for both Open Contrail as well as Juniper Contrail, which is supported by Juniper Networks, but is the same source code. Thank you. Any other questions? We're over time, so I'm, I'm maybe stealing. All right, thanks very much, folks. Thanks, guys.